السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم um, So today we're going to be covering some of the most uh, interesting parts of Islamic history uh, I began with a quote here from Chinggis Khan which I think is interesting Why are we listening to him? Wasn't he crazy? Um, but this is an important quote because he entered when he conquered Uzbekistan he went to the Grand Masjid of Samarkand and he went straight for the mimbar. So everybody's like, okay, what's happening? Is Genghis Khan giving a khutbah or what? And he said, the reason I'm here is because you guys are being punished by God. He said, I am the punishment of God descending upon you. If you had not committed all these great sins, God would have never sent somebody as horrible as me because I'm the punishment that's being sent to you. And this is, although, uh, as you know, they believe in, in, they worship, you know, the animal spirits, right? They, this is a shamanism or tengrism that was practiced by the Mongols. Um, but he learned a little bit about Islam uh, and he used some of that against Muslims. Um, but his point is that he saw that Muslim ideals were not being practiced by its leadership. And so sometimes the word of truth can be said from a lying person, right? So in this case, this is a word of truth, even though it's from somebody that lies. So here's our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about Qingjiang. This is the province in China, which is majority Muslim, and how Islam entered in China. It always surprises people, especially th those that go for Hajj. A lot of people find out for the first time when they perform the pilgrimage, they're like, I didn't even know that they're Muslim Chinese, right? Because we don't really talk about it. There are about 80 million Muslims in China. Some people put the number at 40 million, less than that. But I think if anything, it's more than what's reported. We're going to talk about Salah din and King Richard I of England, the empire of Mali, uh, the uh, Mongols uh, reaching Baghdad, Islam in Bengal, the Dili Sultanate, uh, which is a precursor to the Mughal Empire, which is for another day. And we're going to conclude with speaking about two names that you usually don't see together, only in our presentation, um, Ibn Taymiyyah and Maulana Rumi, rahmatullah alayhim ajma'in. May Allah have mercy on all of them. So we'll, talk with, we'll start with China. There are currently 15 million Muslims in the Qingjiang province, this has uh, historically been known as East Turkestan. Some people call it Chinese Turkestan. And this is the area that historically was part of Central Asia. It was not historically part of China, but since the Qing Dynasty, it has been part of China. So this goes back to the late 1700s, I think about 1800 when that happened. So it has been over 200 years that it has been part of China. And so a lot of what we see in the ethnic cleansing or the re-education of Muslims in China is because of this. They're trying to make them Chinese. Why is it that Han Muslims in China are able to practice their faith openly and there are lots of masjids in other parts of China and nobody persecutes them. And at the same time, the same government persecutes the Uyghur or the Uyghur Muslims because they're Muslim. And that's because there's unrest in that. So at the end of the day, it's really about politics, right? But that's not what today's presentation is about. It's about the area of Qingjiang being at the crossroads of the Silk Road. So this is an area that was wealthy because it's bringing all the trade from China, from India, Central Asia, uh, Khorasan and the Middle East and they're connected to Europe as well even though today they seem very disconnected after the battle of the Talas River as you remember the Ming Dynasty or I'm sorry the Ting Dynasty uh, fought with the uh, Abbasid it was one of the vassal states of the Abbasid Empire and the Muslims were successful and so from that moment the Chinese empire stopped its expansion westward. But then what happened was Bughra Khan introduced Islam. And this happened in a way 
that, and by the way, don't get distracted by the word Khan. If you see the word Khan, it doesn't mean the person's Muslim. I know in some places around the world, it reminds me of the movie, remember? My name is Khan, right? So the whole premise is like, if you say your name is Khan, everybody thinks you're Muslim. But that's not the case in Central Asia, right? Khan is a title that means chief, right? So anyone who is respected or a leader within their community has the title Khan. It doesn't mean that the person is Muslim. But what he, he actually has the title of Sutuk. And he was inspecting a caravan and he saw the adhan go off. So somebody called the prayer. And as soon as these merchants heard the adhan, isn't it amazing what happens when we practice our religion? He was so struck by that, that everybody stopped what they were doing and they prayed to God. He said, this has to be the true religion, just based on that, without learning anything else. And then he studied Islam, he became very devout. And it said that as a result of Bugra Khan becoming Muslim, that 200,000 tents, that means 200,000 families. So close to a million people converted. And, but don't get too, too in love with him because he took advantage of a very smart technique, which is called the fatwa. And he went to one of these religious scholars and he said, my uncle, Arsalan Khan, right? These are the two that were ruling together. He said, he's non-Muslim. So I need a fatwa that says that he can't be the leader because we're a Muslim nation, right? So he got the fatwa and then he, took over and got rid of his uncle, right? <laughs> Which is a really smart move, actually. I don't know if it's ethical, but he did it. And it continued being a Muslim-led empire in the form of the uh, Chagtai Khanate until the period of the Qing uh, dynasty. So it continued to be a Muslim majority, at least in rule for hundreds of years. And in addition, we should also mention that all we've spoken about is at the high level, chief leadership. But then on the everyday person level, it was mostly the efforts of Sufis from the Naqshbandi and the Kubrawi tariqas um, that had a great influence. In the case of Qingjiang, it's mostly the influence of Bahauddin Naqshband, right? Which is also important because this is a branch of, of, of Sufism that emphasizes scholarship and learning and um, it's closer to the Sharia, right? Uh, and they take pride in the fact that they avoid musical instruments and other forms of sama that are found in a lot of the other Sufi tariqas, including the Kubrawi one. The Kubrawi one uh, emphasizes universalism, which can be very appealing. This is why in Buddhist majority places, right? This, that was a Buddhist majority location. The Kubrawi Tariqa always got a lot of uh, ad adherence because it was more accessible, because it talks about common um, principles and values across different, different religions. So now that we've mentioned about China, we're going to go back to the scene. We ended on a cliffhanger, if you all remember, right? So Salah al-Din, what happened in the Battle of Hitlin? This is the famous scene. They, they won, and it was a very decisive victory, right? Um, in the Battle of Hittin, which is in Palestine, not too far from Jerusalem. And now he has to figure out what his next move is gonna be. And so here he is, he's hot in pursuit, and he strategically makes these moves in quick succession. The reason he moves so fast is in order to avoid reinforcements coming in from Europe. This is important because when Pope Urban II hears the news, he actually dies, right, within a matter of months. And people said he died out of grief because he was so upset. And then the, the Pope that came after him calls for this, these huge reinforcements, right, that come in the order of hundreds of thousands and even millions. So two days later, he marches to Akka, he goes to Turan, he goes to Haifa, he goes to Beirut, he goes to Nablus, and he makes sure that he attacks all of these po crusader posts, right? And once he's done that in order to prevent, so you know typical Muslim reaction. What do you, remember I told you people were mad at Salah Hadin for most of his life, right? What was the number one, what was their complaint? What was the issue everybody had with Salah Hadin? They had a lot of issues, but they had one main complaint. Keep in mind, the man is like pushing 60, 70 years old, 
right, at this time. I don't remember his exact age, but it's around there. He's an old man, you know, and he's a professional world-class warrior in battle, right? He's, he's not a young guy at this time. Why are people mad at Salah al You've been, we, you've been talking about Jerusalem since we've been born. Just do it already. What have you been doing? So people, we, we think of Salah al because we know how the story ends. But they, we know that he conquers it. But the other people in his life, they don't know that he wins. Because it didn't happen yet. So because of that, people don't have that viewpoint of Salah al the way that we do. And so this is a, another lesson that whenever you do something great in life, people are always going to pull you down. They're always going to tell you it's no good. Why don't you do it the other way? You know, also somebody else has a better idea. So here he is, he's going around and he's attacking all of these uh, fortresses. And everybody said, what are you doing? Get to Jerusalem already, come on. But he does it strategically to make sure that they don't enter into Jerusalem and what's going to happen the next day then there's a new army that's attacking Jerusalem. So he needs to prevent them from having any ports. And the, actually the only port that they have less, left is Antioch, which is right up north. They don't have any other access point because Salah al has, within the matter of one week, has taken over the whole area of Palestine. Right? And this all happens in the end of the month of Rajab, and here we are on the 29th night of Rajab today, right? So this kind of coincides with the same time of year. On the 26th of Rajab, then Balian, he's the head of Jerusalem, he says that if you don't accept the terms, then we're going to kill all 5,000 Muslims. There were very few Muslims during all those years of crusaders. And he said, we're going to destroy the Masjid. We'll destroy Masjid Aqsa. Can you believe the audacity? He said he would destroy the, the, the masjid and he would kill everyone. And most of the advisors to Salah al-Din, what did they tell him to do? Hmm? Yes, they said, just keep fighting. If he destroys the masjid, we will rebuild it. If he kills the 5,000, forget about it. Don't give in to his terms. But as they entered into the night of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, they agreed to terms. Salah al-Din, even though he had the upper hand, he accepted the terms of Balian and he allowed, for, and this allowed for the peaceful entry in Jerusalem. This is why you guys have, have probably heard me to say that every single time Muslims have entered into Jerusalem, no one has been killed. This is a historical fact, okay? We can debate about a lot of other things, but whenever anyone else enters into Jerusalem, heads drop. Right? When the Crusaders did it, they were in, according to their own report, they were wading up to the knee in dead bodies. Right? Because I mean they were also trying to show off, like, you know, we they, they even exaggerate their own numbers, by the way, because they want Muslims to be scared that when we show up, we're gonna kill everyone. Mongols did the same thing. In Baghdad, they said we killed two million, according to the Mongolian Mongolian report. So you just have to kind of be cautious when you read these reports. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's significant that it happened on the night of Al-Isra and Mi'raj. Because for all Muslims, it cannot possibly be a, you know, something that just ha coincidence. There has to be a meaning in that. Although the 27th night is not confirmed, right? Um, it's possible that the night of Al-Isra and Mi'raj could be another night. But it's one of the main reports that we have. The Crusaders, they quickly moved to get reinforcements. The Pope... Can you imagine Europe, they're always d d disunited, fighting each other. Europe unites in a big way. The Pope and all of the rulers, the Iberian Peninsula, the French, the Germans, and the British, they all coalesce. They say any able man, any able person must go and fight in the Holy Land. And of course, the legendary forgiveness, we see that Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, not only does he not harm anyone in Jerusalem, they even forgive all of the crusaders and their families. Everyone is untouched. And as we mentioned before, in the earlier wars with Salah al-Din, why is it that he didn't do that? He ransomed them and 
the ones that didn't get ransom, Salahuddin, he killed the Crusaders in the earlier battles, if we want to be historically accurate. So somebody might wonder, well, why is it that he forgave the Crusaders in the end and he didn't, and he didn't kill anyone? And in the earlier battles, anybody have a good reason? We're guessing here in terms of his thought process, but I think I know. Yes. That's true, to have an exchange. The main reason is that Salahuddin is gracious in victory. The same way the Prophet and people ask, they say, why was he so tough with Bani Quraidha? Why was he so tough? And there are, very instant, there are specific instances in which the Prophet was very tough and that he didn't forgive enemies. But on the day of the conquest of Mecca, was there any bloodshed? No. Because the Prophet is gracious in victory. If you've already won, then anything that you're doing, it's not strategic. It's because of revenge. Because you already won. And so we see Salah al-Din, he's actually following the example of the Prophet ﷺ. In the earlier instances, there were strategic reasons. How can you release a crusader? What's going to happen if you release him? He's going to turn around and start killing people. So they couldn't release them earlier. But once they had already defeated the crusaders, so then there was a reason to be gracious in the time of victory. This is the map of the third crusade at the tail end. We see King Philip of France, that's marked in orange. Uh, the British came by sea. They stopped in, in uh, Marseille, and then they went from there to Italy, and then all the way to Akka uh, through Antioch. Actually, actually directly to Akka. Um, and then we see that also there's King Barbarossa. So King Frederick Barbarossa. Now, what happened to King uh, Frederick? This is another thing which has to be the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's literally in a river he's crossing he's there he made it all the way from Germany right from Prussia and he shows up and he falls off of his horse crossing a river and he dies there there's a million troops that came with him from Germany after he dies the whole army kind of falls apart and most of them go home and don't continue on without him because the king is dead King Richard I eventually becomes the head of the Crusaders. And that's why we know all the stories with King Richard I. He's coming from England. King Philip II coming from France. And King Richard made the famous statement that even if they kill one of us, we'll send a thousand more. Now this is very important because Muslims don't realize how badly outnumbered they were throughout the Crusaders. This is crazy because, uh, you know, a lot of us don't realize this because we're like, well, there are millions of Muslims around the whole Muslim world. Why are the Muslims so outnumbered? The Europeans are coming from Europe. Like, this is a long trip. The Muslims are already there. Like, does it make sense that there are that many Crusaders and so few Muslims? Why is it that there are no Muslims fighting in Jerusalem? Why are there no Muslims fighting the Crusaders? Please be honest. Just tell me the truth. They are busy fighting each other, number one. And number two is because they don't care. I mean, this is our history. They really didn't care. right? And we're going to see this in the story because Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, he is literally crying because he has sent letters to all of the leaders. Do you know how many caliphs there were? There were three Khalifas, three people. I mean, why do you need three Khalifas? There's only supposed to be one in the world. There were three people claiming to be the Khalifa at the time. None of them sent a single troop. Right? The only one that assisted him, and it's really the Ayyubids, were the Mamluks, right? And of course, the Zingid Empire that he was part of. So the Europeans, they said, don't worry, we have more where that came from. We'll send even more people. They went around Akka. And they created trenches. This is kind of a harbinger of World War I, you know, where they create trenches, they create reinforcements, they barricade themselves so no one can attack them. And for two years, there's almost a stalemate, right? And then, of course, at, at, at one point, there's a truce. They break the truce. They kill the 3,000 that are garrisoned over there, Muslims. But then the battle continues. 
And as I mentioned, there is complete apathy and disregard from Muslims around the whole world. They say Salah al-Din and his Ayyubid army is going to deal with it. And there are no supports that are coming from anywhere around the Muslim world. Now, King Richard and Salah al-Din are famous. Has anyone seen the movie, Kingdom of Heaven? I think it's a great movie. I don't know how accurate it is. There are some, there are some things that as a Muslim, we, we would do it differently, for sure. Um, but I think they try to be fair. I think they, they try to. Um, and the history favors Muslims, and the facts favor Muslims. So they had no choice. Otherwise, they would have been very dishonest. But we have some images here from the movie, right? And so King Richard is described here by Salah al-Din. I think it's Salah al-Din, or it could be a, histor a Muslim historian. I think this is a historian. That there is something special about him. And we've never seen anyone like him. He was always ahead of everyone else. Because when you think of a king, you think of the king all the way at the end. But King Richard, he was the king, you know, like from the battle scene in the movie that he rushes into the battle with his men, with him being first and foremost. No one can stand against him. So a true warrior and truly courageous. And King Richard, there were some instances in which he was less than honest. But in most cases, he showed the same kind of chivalry that Salah al-Din had. So they have this crisis in Akka, and he makes this dua in which he said, Ya Allah, I have exhausted all of my own resources in assisting your deen. Now I need your fadl and your grace. Otherwise, there's no hope for us. I have no more resources that I can devote to this cause. Whatever I had, I've given it, right? He left palaces, he left jewels, he left crowns. He lived in a tent for years, right? Sacrifice, leaving everything behind, all of the luxuries of this dunya, and it, he still couldn't win. So he asked Allah to give him an opening, and that happened without any reason. Seemingly out of nowhere, the crusaders, they lifted the siege, and they decided to go home. The... Governor Balian, he said that 600,000 crusaders came. That's the army that came from France and from England, because remember the army from Germany was dispersed, so, but most of them didn't. He said, oh, he said, you did something that never happened in history, that there was an army of 600,000 people and only one out of 10 returned, right? That means that 90%, so basically, more than 500,000 crusaders died in the Third Crusade over the course of many years. Now, a little bit about his personality. What did King Richard say when he left? Because, I mean, this was his life dream. I mean, it's crazy that he even left to begin with. And he said, the only reason I'm leaving is because of Salah al-Din. Otherwise, we're supposed to win. As long as there is a man like Salah al-Din, protecting Jerusalem, we are never going to be able to take it. Not because we don't have the money, not because we don't have the troops, not because we don't have the expertise, but because of the sheer willpower of somebody like Salah al -Din. And of course, he was advised after the Battle of Hittin that he shouldn't confront the army directly. You should just go gradually, pick off all those forts. But Salah al -Din, he said no. I'm not going to hide from the Crusaders because I don't know how long I have to live. So before I die, before my Lord takes me, we need to complete the mission. And you all should fight to please your Lord. You should not fight in order to please me. And so if you go to Damascus, if you go to Al-Masjid Al-Umawi, the Umayyad Mosque, to the left side, there is a white grave which is the grave of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. And on that grave, it's written in that marble, it says that, O oh Allah, as his final victory, open for him the doors of Jannah. Right? Because of all of the victories he had in this life. So we hope and we pray, inshallah, that he has that victory. Now we're going to change our attention to something completely different. Before the Disney, of course, takes history and then gives it a twist. Every, anybody hear of the Lion King? There is a real Lion King. That's where they got the name. That is Sundiata Kida. 
This is the first emperor of the empire of Mali. Right? There's a depiction of him to the right. And, you know, that's, I think, Mufasa, right? From the movie. Yeah, we grew up on The Lion King, right? So the empire of Mali happens because there's a decline of the Ghana empire. Now, the Ghana empire precedes Islam. And there were some that, were, that converted and became Muslim, but the majority of them were not Muslim. But here you have Timbuktu, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, Jana, you have a few different cities that are all uh, within that same area. And they're all along the Nile, not the Nile, the Niger River, which is extremely fertile. So you have this weird situation where you have the Sahara to the north, you were in the Sahel, which is the sub-Saharan area, and you have this beautiful river. So you have this confluence of agriculture, you have gold, you have slave trade, you have salt coming from the desert areas. Everything is all coming together in the same place, right? And you have the Mandi uh, Mandinka people, right? So many of the people in these areas um, in West Africa, they are originally part of the Mandinka people. Remember we talked about the Fulani people before? This is another one of the major groups. And they were loved by Sunyada, who after he left, he gained allies, he increased his prestige, and he fought the Soso kingdom in a great battle in 1235. And he was very professional as an administrator, because a lot of people, they win in battle, but they can't run things. He created a document, a constitution, that elaborated on how the government would run, what the social rights would be like, and how they would engage in good governance. His successor is the famous Mansa Musa. So you have an illustration there of him. He is known as the richest man in history. I don't know if it's true. There's no way to prove it or disprove it. But he is regarded at the time to have been the richest man ever. And the reason for that is because in 1324, he decided to leave the empire of Mali and to go on a journey for Hajj. And this drawing is his entourage that is with him on the way to Hajj. And he spent, he carried so much gold with him and they spent so much money and he gave so much to the poor that every time he visited a city, they spent so much the entire local economy would go into a tailspin. There would be so much inflation because the economy would have a shock to its system. It's like after COVID where we had the economic recovery package, right? So that's what, this was their COVID economic stimulus was Mansa Musa coming through. And this covers the area of Mali, Senegal, Senegambia, right? They go together, Guinea, Niger, and some of the other areas. I think Burkina Faso as well, some of the smaller countries, right? Then there's a beautiful grand masjid that is constructed in Timbuktu. It becomes a hub for Islamic learning. You have a great university. By the way, this is unique because remember the Alexandria uh, library that was destroyed. The Bayt al-Hikmah that was destroyed. Every library is destroyed except in Timbuktu, if you go there now, the library still exists. And the manuscripts are there that are hundreds of years old. Unfortunately, there's nobody that's funding this that wants to go through and do research and figure out what's there. But it's said that there are over one million volumes that exist in Timbuktu right now um, in West Africa. Uh, and it becomes this hub for learning. It's also a lot of artisans. There's a lot of support and patrons of wood carving, of metalwork. And the unique thing about the Mali Empire is that the leaders were famous for performing the Hajj and for being very devout and practicing Muslims. So this is a lot of times when we talk about Muslim rulers, we forget about West Africa. And this was actually the wealthiest and the most famous of, um, of all of the Muslim rules at the time. Okay, now for the main subject. This is the rise of al maghul the Mongols. So the real name of Chinggis Khan is Temujan, right? That's his birth name. He wanted to fulfill the dream of his grandfather, 
Kabul Khan to unite the tribes. So he marries his wife, Borte, who is from another tribe. And then he unites with his blood brother. So not, not his blood brother, but his, uh, what do you call? Where are you? You know where you swear to be brothers, whatever that's called, right? Hmm? Blood brother, okay, I said it right, yeah. With his blood brother, Tughrul. And so he's making strategic moves in order to expand his network, those that are loyal to him. And then finally in 1206, they have an election. He calls an assembly in which all of the Mongols come together and he is elected as the Khagan. That means he's the Khan of the Khans, right? So he's the head Khan. And he reforms the system and he moves the tribes around. So what he does is he'll take the son of one chief and put him under the, another chief. And then he'll take that chief's son and puts him under the other chief. That's how you know that people are going to behave well, right? Because if his son is with him, so everybody's going to be loyal. To, he created this web of loyalty in which everybody has to answer back to him. He created Yasa, which is their law. And he created regiments that were based on merit. He conquered the Jin dynasty, the Song dynasty. So these are the two ones that are in China, right? Jin is the one that's closest, and then Song, which is below it. And then you have the Western Xia um, dynasty, which is not in Mongolia, but is the Western part of China. And then by the year 1215, he conquers the whole of the Song dynasty and Beijing falls. Who would have imagined that the great uh, dynasty and a great city like Beijing would fall? And what does China has that makes them a little complacent? Anybody been to China and visited? The Great Wall. What happened to the Great Wall? What did they do with the Great Wall? Anybody know? I think they just climbed over it if I'm not mistaken, right? Because the Great Wall only works if you have a few guys. I mean, if you have 100,000, um, it's possible that the, they might have destroyed part of it. But the reason that they were able to do this is because they just overwhelmed them. They weren't prepared. The Mongols had hundreds of, of thousands of troops. And when they did it, devastation followed. It's, meant, it's, it's recorded in Chinese reports that Beijing was greasy because of all of the flesh and human fat that was left there on the earth. So this is the way that the Mongols rolled. Under Chinggis Khan, they conquered all of China very, very quickly and all of Central Asia. Most of Central Air Asia, including the Islamic areas. So when we talk about Xinjiang, when we talk about Uzbekistan, today Kazakhstan, and uh, the beginning of Khorasan, all of those areas, they did not experience most of the devastation of the Mongol. You guys know why? Why is it that Central Asia was not devastated the way that China and the Middle East was? They didn't resist. They did not resist. So because Central Asia knew that they didn't have any chance against the Mongols, of course there were lots of other atrocities, but they did not destroy uh, Samarkand and they did not destroy Bukhara and a lot of uh, these other areas, the way that they destroyed Baghdad. If you go to Baghdad now, you're not going to find any of the historical places that we talked about because the city was leveled when the Mongols went there. Okay. So he sends, <laughs> he sends a letter, right, to, to the Sultan, and he says that if you wish to spare yourself and your, this is al mustasim al mustasim Billah, right, too many complicated names. If you wish to spare yourself and your venerable family, give heed to my advice with the ear of intelligence. If you do not, you will see what God has willed. See how they keep using God in all their letters? <laughs> because they don't believe in God, but they know that we do, right? And, and he makes this threat. He says, like, you have to give in or just wait and see what's going to happen. Monke, he is the Khagan. He is the head Khan in Mongolia. And he sends Hulagu Khan, his brother, in order as the head general to surround Baghdad. They come from the north, but they divide into different segments. So they come from three sides. 
And then from those three, they surround the walls of Baghdad from all four sides. They keep sieging until, and Baghdad at the time has huge walls. People thought this is an impenetrable city. In fact, that's what the Khalifa, the Abbas al Khalifa said. He said, I prefer just to stay and defend my city. Once he saw all of the Mongols around his walls, he sent out a message. He said, no, 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 we can do a deal, right? At that point, he said, well, we went, uh, you know, uh, Monke, not Monke, Halagu Khan. He said, well, we've come all the way. So we're going to finish what we're doing because we're already here. What follows is the greatest and the biggest massacre in all of human history, right? There have been, I mean, there have been other wars that have been more devastating, but there has never been a massacre of this magnitude in which there were over 1 million people that were intentionally killed in Baghdad. They were not people that were fighting in battle. They spent an entire week because it took them that long to kill everyone in the city. They, hmm? Well, in Baghdad, the majority, there were non-Muslims in there, but it's 90% Muslim. Baghdad is a Muslim city, right? This is the heartland of Islam. Baghdad was the capital of the Muslim world, capital for the Muslims. And they went through, they killed man, woman, child, young, old, baby. It didn't matter. Well, some of the babies they kept in order to train them as to become Mongol, right? Some people, they say it was even two million if you look at the Mongolian sources, right? But I'm a little bit skeptical. I think there weren't two million people living there. How can they kill two million people if they don't exist? So, you know, the, the population in cities, one million at that time is an enormous number. I mean, is there a city on earth at that time other than Baghdad that has a million people, right? And also over one million volumes are all thrown into the Euphrates until the water becomes black because of all of the destruction of learning. They keep the Khalifa the entire time waiting. They treat him very well. They say, you're going to be our host. We're going to hang out at the palace together. They spend a week together. And at the end of it, once they've killed everyone in the city, he's the very last one to die. But they have a Mongolian superstition that the blood of nobility is not supposed to spill on the earth. Otherwise, they're going to be cursed. So they do this famous Mongolian trick. What do they do? They, oh, strangling is, but in this case, they wrap him in a they wrap him in a carpet and they trample him until he dies. Now I, I want to remember we talked about Salah Hadin and why he was able to win because of the psychological component. The Crusaders they believe that God must be with the Muslims. I mean, this is a big factor of why Muslims won. Is Christians started to doubt their cause, right? That's part of it because they said, well, the Muslims keep winning. God must be with them. When Mongols face the Muslims in Central Asia, in Iraq, in these areas, do you know what Muslims were saying at the time? That's exactly right. They said, this is Gog and Magog. This is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Most Muslims at the time of the Mongols said that they are not human beings. They must be devils. Now, why is that harmful? Why did that lead to the defeat? You cannot fight an enemy that you think that is going to win. So because they had told themselves that there's this conspiracy, and this is the same problem that Muslims have today. We say, oh, they control Congress, they control this, they have all the money. So then you're defeated before you even start. Why even bother? Just go home and, and forget about it. So with the Mongols, a big component of why they lost is because they said, well, there's no possibility. We can't win against superhumans, right? These are like super villains. And there were many stories, some of which were fake, about Mongol atrocities. But the battle of the heart is the one that was successful. We did not, yes, there's the battle of Ain Jalut that we're going to talk about. But even the battle of Ain Jalut happened because Berke Khan accepted Islam, who is the grandchild of Chinggis Khan. And he had four sons, right? And Berke is the first one, but many of the grandchildren 
and the great grandchildren became Muslim. And that is the main reason that the Muslims got out of that suffocation of the Mongols. Almost all of them, there's one ch chain that continued to follow the Tengri religion, but most of them all became Muslim. And this is why you don't really hear about the Mongols. You hear about the Mughal Empire, which is some, somewhat related that we're going to talk about next week. And you hear about the Ilkhanid. You hear about the Timur Lane. You hear about a lot of the other Chuktai Empire. You hear about other ones that are from the descendants. But because they were Muslim, their behavior was completely different. right? And so the battle of the heart is what makes a difference. Now this is in the Muslim memory. Other than the battle of, you have the battle of Yarmouk, right? At the time of the Prophet, uh, well, close to, close to, in the time of, uh, how many years after is it? It's less than 10 years, right? Uh, yeah, so eight years, that sounds right. So about eight years after the passing of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, against the Romans, that is uh, with Khalid ibn al-Walid, that is considered one of the most important battles in history. Then you have the Battle of Hittin, which is very dear to the Muslims, but in terms of history, may not be the most important battle. Then you have the Battle of Ain Jalut. This is the turning point. This is an existential crisis for the Muslims. People are saying, this is Yawm al Qiyamah. They were having, do you know what people were debating at the time? They said that, is the Day of Judgment happening today or tomorrow? This is what people really believe. This Ummah has never faced anything worse than the invasion of the Mongols. No matter how bad you think it is now, it was a lot, lot worse then. And the Ain Jalut was the, was the watershed moment. That was the turning point. It was exactly at the place where David faced Goliath. Again, you can't make this stuff up. It has to mean something. It can't be a coincidence that the Muslims facing the Mongols are just like David facing Goliath. And again, in Islamic history, guess who saves the day? It's always Egypt. When Egypt is strong, no, I mean, I'm not saying this because I love Egypt, I live there. I'm telling you because this is a fact. When Egypt is strong, the whole Muslim world is strong. And when Egypt is weak, the whole Ummah is weak. This has been consistent in all of Islamic history. That Egypt swoops in and saves the day because everyone else has disappeared. And it's only the Mamluks. Just as Salah al-Din, we say, uh, Salah al-Din was Kurdish, he was not Egyptian. When I say Egypt, I don't mean, I mean the place Egypt, I don't mean Egyptians, right? Because most of the rulers in Egypt were not Egyptian. Even what does Egyptian mean? That, that's that's going to take hours to talk about, right? So Egypt saves the day through the Mamluks, right? Just as Salah al-Din did through the Ayyubid Empire. And again, symbolic victory that takes place on the 25th day in Ramadan. Many, what, when did the Battle of Badr happen? In the 17th of Ramadan. When, in 1973, the war, what day did that happen on? On the 10th of Ramadan. So many important dates in Islamic history, they all happen because you think of Ramadan and fasting, you don't think of battle. But in fact, there are many important events that took place in the month of Ramadan. So you have Baybars and Qutuz, these are the two Mamluk leaders. And look at how coordinated they are. Look how unified they are. They divide the army into two. One takes the main army, the other one takes a small number, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the troops. Then they have the smaller percentage of the troops attack in the front, a direct attack. The Mongols, of course, they outnumber them. They all, the whole battle becomes concentrated. They, it looks like they're starting to retreat, but it's a strategic retreat in order to get the whole army in one location. And meanwhile, behind them is the main army. And they make a maneuver in which they surround the whole Mongolian army. Look at the tadbir, look at the planning and thought that's behind this. When people are unified, they're able to do the impossible. They surround them and it is a decisive victory for the Muslims 
And the biggest shock is the psychological one. Would you believe that prior to Ain Jalut, the Mongols had never, ever been defeated? So they, psychologically, they were shook. They, they're not used to losing. They always win. And so for Muslims, they had lost every battle with the Mongols. So it told everybody, yes, it is possible. And so the next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about what happens after the Mongols. But we want to talk about some of the other areas, Islam in India, and especially Islam in Bengal. Because you would think that Bengal is all the way in the east. I mean, we're talking not even hundreds of miles away. We're talking about thousands of miles away from the Middle East. How does Islam go from Arabia to Bengal? And today it's, it's 150 million. I think it's more than that. I took the official statistic. And 90% of the population in Bangladesh, and by the way, this is only Bangladesh. If we talk about West Bengal, which is a big state in India, then it's going to be over 200 million, right? And that are Muslim. So it begins with the Arab trading posts. So there are merchants that are traveling south of the Delta. And then you have the Ghurid dynasty. After the Ghaznavid dynasty, you have another dynasty that converted to Islam and they took Lahore, right? And uh, that had been under the Ghaznavid Empire and they took UP, right? The northern state in India. So they took most of North India, but like a thin strip going across the country. And then Muhammad bin Bakhtiar Khalji, he conquers the dynasty, the Sina dynasty. And this was a great dynasty that existed in present day Bangladesh and West Bengal and also covered the state of Bihar. And the Muslims were successful in doing so. And then they uh, attacked the city of Nadia that is uh, in today, it's in India, in West Bengal in the year 1204. And there's a new state that shows up because initially this Conquest is part of the Delhi Sultanate. It's not something separate. But what ends up happening is that Bangladesh or Bengal is so isolated. It's so far away that they are operating autonomously. They're running their own country. And what ends up also happening is that people are fleeing from other areas, from out west, from out north. There are Buddhist monks. They are some Hindus that are traveling east. They're looking for a place that is more open and more accepting. And Bangladesh is surrounded by these mountains, right? Because after that, you have Tibet, right? And you have uh, Myanmar, right? And so you have this natural barrier that's around the region of Bengal. And so when they get to Nadia, which is Navadvip, that's what it was called at the time, then it was uh, defended only by 18 soldiers on, on horses. And they couldn't believe when they arrived, they said, where, where are the defenses? Because they swept through Bengal so quickly, the news that they were coming didn't even arrive. So nobody was even there to fight them, right? And then of course, as we've mentioned, the political reality is one thing, but the reality of the people on the ground is different. So you have people like Shah Jalal, if you arrive in Dhaka today, you are going to arrive at Shah Jalal International Airport, right? That's the name of the airport. It's a very important part of, uh, of the Bengali identity, and especially in Silat, right? Because that's where he spent all of his time. So he is considered from the great awliya, those that were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who was also a ahead of his community at a time in which the vast majority of Bangladesh was practicing what religion? Not Hinduism, Buddhism. Buddhism. Oh, and you might think, well, but there are no Buddhists now. There are 10%, actually where my father is from, is from Baishal, and in that city it's more than that. It's about 15, maybe 20% are Hindu in that city, depending on where you go in Bangladesh. Some areas are 100% Muslim, but you can't find that many Buddhists. Why, did, why is that the case? That's because the first people that converted to Islam in India were Buddhist. And those were the main people that converted in the beginning. Then later, there were conversions from among Hindus. But usually with the Hindu community, it took longer for them to, uh, to convert and to embrace 
Islam. And so you have people like Shah Jalal that were able to bring Islam in a way that was understood by them and that was readily accepted. Then you have, of course, after um, Khalji, part of the Khalji dynasty, you have the leader Iwas, uh, who arranged pensions for scholars. And as soon as you put, this is a big, you know, this is a big thing. A lot of masjids, they don't want to pay to have a good imam. They're like, why do we not, why can we not find an imam? Because you don't want to pay him a salary, right? There are a lot of masjids like that. So it was, he had this, he had the idea. He said, well, how do we get people to come to Bengal? All we have to do is put the job posting out there that we are offering pensions. Lo and behold, people are coming from Egypt, they're coming from Syria, they're coming, the whole world is coming to Bangladesh, to Bengal, because they're getting a good salary. They had one great scholar that came from Damascus, they paid him 18,000 taka, right, which is like a fortune, right? I don't know what that was worth at the time, just for coming and for teaching classes. After the Khaljis, then in 1338, Bengal separated, divided into three, then got reunited, but you see that because the leaders were very liberal and they supported the literature and painting, then Islam started to expand very gradually. But it is still the minority religion. It's only in the Mughal Empire that is when Islam becomes the majority at that time. Okay, so that's Bengal. Ibn Battuta, of course, he goes on an international journey. He starts west you know, with North Africa, and he studies, or he visits all the Mediterranean areas, then he travels eastward, he goes to Central Asia, India, he visits Sri Lanka, uh, China, Indonesia, Philippines, he goes all throughout the world, and he makes a special trip, he goes to Chittagong, and from there he travels through the mountain, not the mountain, through the forest, in order to get to Silet, just to find Shah Jalal, who I talked about earlier. And we had a picture of, of uh, the Mazar of Shah Jalal over there. And guess where he finds him? He's an international traveler. He's got all of his you know, entourage with him. Guess where they find him? In a cave. They find the famous scholar, uh, Anwali, is in a cave, and he has a goat with him that he keeps in order to provide some milk and butter and yogurt. So it shows that at the time, nowadays, you're not going to find Sufis like that. Most of them are, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, enjoying all of the benefits of being famous. But you see that <laughs> in the early generation, right, in the 1200s, that there were people who really practiced that kind of zuhud, that kind of asceticism and renunciation of the dunya. The Dili Sultanate, which we started to talk about, started with, uh, Jalaluddin. He became the Sultan of Delhi after he removed the Mamluks. And then he made his nephew Alauddin, he gave him the title that he is the Amir, so he is like the one of his ministers, like a wazir. And what he does is Alauddin is very famous because he protects India from the invasion of the Mongols. And this is very important because People, when they talk about the Mughal Empire, especially nowadays in India, it's very political. They always say the Muslims are foreign invaders. And this is absolutely a lie. That is not true. The Mongols, they never entered into India. And the Muslims, Islam in India is not a foreign invasion, right? And actually, it's quite the opposite. The Muslim leaders are the reason that the Mongols never entered into India. They protected India from the Mongols. And Ala ad -Din, whether you like him or not, he's the main person that did that. He repels the Chuktai dynasty from entering. Um, but then, guess what he does after he wins against the Mongols? This, this shows up in the movie that I'm going to show you in a minute, right? Then he turns the army around in the opposite direction, and he heads to Gujarat, and he heads to Rajasthan, and he takes over all of those Rajput dynasties, and he marches to the south, and he gets allegiance from the southern dynasties as well. In a very, very short period, the Delhi Sultanate has conquered and taken over more than half of India, right? And it happens very fast before anyone can, can unite, and part of that is because the non-Muslim Rajput dynasties are not on the same page. They're disunited. 
And so they don't organize against that. He has a huge army of about half a million. He imposes price controls to keep things very cheap and he pays very, very low salaries. And that's how he's able to do that. That's the Manar of Qutbuddin that comes later on. And the Dili Sultanate has become very controversial, right? Because with the Mongols, people know, with the Mughal Empire, people know Babur, people know Aurangzeb, they always fight about Aurangzeb, right? The same usual things that we've heard. But this has become very controversial because they usually depict this as Arab and uh, uh, Persian invaders. And that's not true. A lot of the depictions of this sultanate are uh, as uh, evil and uh, that they persecuted. In fact, Ala ad dins successor was married to a Hindu. Most of these rulers, by the way, their wives are Hindu. Don't ask for a fatwa if that's allowed, right? At that time, things are very, you know, shaky, right? <laughs> No, 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 they didn't convert. They didn't convert. We know that historically, right? So these are not very religious and very pious people, right? So it's not like they're trying to spread Islam. In fact, in many cases, they, they, they want to implement jizya. They want to charge people money. So they actually don't want people to convert into Islam. Okay. Anybody see this movie? <laughs> so this is the big blockbuster movie that was very controversial. It's Padmavat, right? Uh, this is from 2018, right? And so they have, you guys know Ranveer Singh, right? The famous Bollywood actor. He did a very good job, by the way, because he looked very evil, right? And so, of course, you have a Muslim in a movie. Before, what was the, before in Bollywood, if there's a Muslim, it was, it was of course, going to be acted by who? By Shah Rukh Khan. And he's like the nice Muslim you can show, you can meet your dad, right? You know, he's that kind of Muslim, right? That, you know, the Hindu might marry, right? But, but this, is, this depiction of a Muslim is the complete opposite, right? And this also shows how Bollywood has gone so virulently anti-Muslim, right? How the sentiment is. And they depicted Khalji as bloodthirsty and also womanizer and trying to take the honest, you know, the integrity of the women. It's very important for Muslims to know that this depiction is completely made up, right? There are reports of this happening, but I'm not convinced that it's true. We can discuss it, you know, if people have thoughts about it um, uh, as, as we get to the end. At the same time, there's a flourishing of music, right? Because I mentioned these are not very orthodox Muslims, right? So you have Amir Khusro, who's the very famous poet. He is a murid of Nizamuddin Awliya. This is from the Chishti Tariqa. He is the father of Qawali, Ghazals, Masnavi, you name it. He invents the sitar. He took three different instruments, combined them together. Uh, I have that on the right side. And he developed the tabla. Tabla existed, but he developed that instrument as well. And as a result, uh, he also kind of merged language. Because Urdu is kind of starting to develop you know, you have like Hindi type language, Urdu, Persian. So the language is becoming very, very rich and very, very beautiful. Now, the last topic that we have is to talk about Ibn Taymiyyah and Maulana Rumi. Ibn Taymiyyah, growing up as a child, he fled from the Mongols and the Tatars. He's a professor at 19, very brilliant. He's teaching. He has excelled from all of the masters around the world. But he very quickly, as a teenager, as a 19, 20-year-old, he said, I don't follow any madhab. Forget about Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik. He said, I'm going to give my own ijtihad. And many of his opinions were, were critiqued because they were innovative. <laughs> now, I'm using that as, you know, because he, a lot of his uh, fatwas about innovation are innovative, right? Because there were new approaches to the sharia. Uh, and I think he was an out-of-the-box thinker. But some of his viewpoints were that a lot of the Sufis at the time, this is the later period of Tasawwuf, was that they had gone too far in venerating saints, in venerating awliya, in worshipping that you're not Sufi, you're actually Quburi, right? We've talked about that, that you start to worship graves, that you start to uh, relate stories of self-harm. And he was very, very critical of that. And so that became, that became very controversial at the time because the kind of within the balance of, uh, 
of, of thought, people had veered more heavily into the Sufi side in the 1200s and 1300s. He actually fought in battle against the Tatars, right, to liberate the Muslim lands. And one of his most famous students is Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziya who has similar viewpoints from Ibn Taymiyyah, but is not controversial at all. So it's somebody who he studied very closely with, but his viewpoints are widely accepted throughout the Muslim world. The greatest controversy is over his aqidah beliefs. He was known to have, remember how we talked about aqidah? We said we go for tanzi, the salaf went for tanzi. They said no tashbih. There should not be any anthropomorphism. Some of the ways in which he described Allah's attributes, they veered into anthropomorphism. And so because of that, scholars, they tried to ban his teaching and ban his books. And in fact, he was even in prison for some time. He also had a very famous fatwa about triple talaq, saying that it only counts as one rather than three pronouncements. And he had another one that if a husband makes an oath about divorcing his wife, then he can get rid of that oath the same way that you pay the penalty for an oath that you make to Allah. So that they were widely criticized at the time, but the Ummah continues to debate it. But Ibn Taymiyyah, there's no doubt, is one of the greatest thinkers, very knowledgeable, even if you disagree with his viewpoints, as I do, uh, especially in the area of Aqidah, there's a lot that you can benefit from, from studying and learning from him. Maulana Rumi, as you know, is the number one poet in the world. He is the most famous poet, and he is also the number one best-selling poet in America. Can you believe that? A man from like a thousand years ago is the number one almost. At the invitation of the Seljuk Sultan, Ala Din Khaykubad, he moved to Konya, right in Anatolia, right in the middle. And he's an Islamic, he's a faqih. People, they accuse Jalal al-Din Rumi saying that, oh, this is not... Uh, this is not an Islamic material. He's a hafiz of the Quran and he's an Islamic jurist. He met Shamsuddin Tabriz. He wrote a six volume Masnavi, masterpiece of poetry. And the reason that he was so widely accepted at the time is because people were not literal the way they are now. So when he says, I'm drunk on love, people understood. He doesn't mean drunk with alcohol. He means drunk, intoxicated. With in a, in a symbolic way. But nowadays he's become a little bit controversial. But in most of Islamic history, he was widely accepted and he was not controversial at all. But I would separate him from the Mevlevi order. Have you guys seen the whirling dervishes? If you go to Istanbul, Maulana Rumi has nothing to do with that. His son and some others, they founded the Mevlevi order. So I'm a little bit skeptical of the Mevlevi order. I hope nobody's a follower, right? Don't be offended, please. Uh, because it wasn't founded by him. So it's like he got famous and people wanted to make an order uh, afterwards. So uh, we've covered like a million different things. Hopefully it's beneficial. I'd like to remind everybody to please come on Saturday's program for Isra and Mi'raj. It's just a one hour program at 6.30. So I hope that you are able to join. If there are any questions, um, we'll take that now whether they're here in person or on Zoom. Are you all, are your brains hurting now? I think my brain's hurting. Okay. Sure, I'm happy to share the presentation, inshallah, and the slides. Just message me. Muslims in China. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah. And in that area, where there's also history, mm -hmm. they have an, an, an interesting. I don't know in plan how it will come into that. Hmm. 
Uramchi, so this is this was part of after the Mongols, they divided, they had the golden horde, and they divided, I think, into uh, into two parts, into the east and the west, right? Into four parts. Yeah, the Mongol. No, no, the whole Mongol is four parts, but in that region it was only divided into two. And I think when the uh, because the rulers were Muslim, so perhaps that is when the local population, and actually next week, inshallah, we're talking about Kashmir, because we talked about the Dili Sultanate, and until that time, nobody entered into Kashmir. Why did nobody enter into Kashmir in all this time? You guys know you're from Kashmir. <laughs> because Sister Zamruda was there, nobody would dare mess with the general. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> no, it was a separate country, but they have a huge army, half a million people. They could conquer Kashmir. And they can start building five star hotels and resorts. It's the most beautiful place on earth, right? You go to Kashmir. Okay. No, we're going too far. We need to stay. <laughs> But this is too much information. Why, how come until this time nobody conquered Kashmir? The reason is it, it was, a, everybody knew about Kashmir. Kashmir is famous, but it was surrounded by mountains. So nobody wanted to take half a million troops through Kashmir. So Islam could only enter in Kashmir in a different way. And the way that it, which we'll talk about next week is, is, is through the traders and the righteous and pious people coming from Persia. Yes. Yes. Okay. Are you inviting us for polo then? <laughs> Right. Pass. So I, to answer your question, I don't think that it happened politically. I think that it was through traders and through scholars passing through that people, yes, in not only Kashmir, but also in Central Asia, the area that you're talking about, I think that's how they became Muslim. We have a couple of questions here. How Mongolia became so small? It's not so small. If you look at the map, the size of Mongolia is huge. Only if you compare to Russia and China, it looks small. In fact, the size of present-day Mongolia is bigger than the historical Mongolia. The Mongolia of Chinggis Khan, Temujin, was actually to the east of that Mongolia. And to the west side, you have the Tatars. And in addition to the Tatars, you have the Karakite Turks. So actually, present-day Mongolia covers a lot of area of what historically would be Turkic people. So there's a little bit of overlapping, an awkward conversation people don't want to get too deep into, which is that Mongol blood is all over the world, right? Because people are traveling, troops are coming, intermarriage, the whole thing gets all mixed up, right? So even like my family name is Mirza. And Mirza is a title that was given either to somebody that's within the government, or in our case, it would be a religious scholar. So it's a title that's bestowed on that, and then it becomes a family name. But this is something that started from the Mongol times, that they had the title. And the Khan name, of course, is more famous. And that's also coming from the Mongol times as well. 
Thank you for talking about the Khilji uh, Sultanate and how in recent years it's misrepresented in the Indian media. It's become very political. I think the reason they do that is because people, they go to Agra and they see the Taj Mahal. They can't, they can lie about like Aurangzeb, but they can't go, they can't make people hate the Mughal Empire. So instead they went for an easy target. This is my theory, that they went for the Delhi Sultanate because they said, oh, those are the evil guys. So that way it would be more believable to the masses and to the public. It's a, demonization. It's a what? It's a demonization. Yes. But you know, it's a dehumanization of Muslim, but I think it's also a victimhood because they're trying to show that Islam is foreign, yeah. right? And, the, and, and there are places in Islamic history where it was the Muslim invader, but in India, it's really not the case. It has, these have always been indigenous Muslims. And yes, the, 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 we're gonna talk about the Mughals, that yes, originally they have Mongol blood, but there's so much intermarriage that I mean, if you did a DNA sample, I mean, it's, it's basically all going to be Indian. And also we're in a time in the world in which people are moving and going from one place to another and borders are very porous there's a real question. This is before 19, this is before 1648, before the Peace of Westphalia in Europe. So what does a nation state even mean? There's no concept of a nation state. There's a concept of tribal affiliation. There's a concept of like ethnicity. So somebody would be like, oh, I'm, I'm Rajasthani, I'm Gujarati. That people understood, nobody, I mean, even the word Bharat, like what, you guys are Indian, many of you, tell me, what does that mean? It just means land, right? Am I, is something I'm missing here? Oh, okay, that, so that kingdom. Yeah, okay. But that doesn't cover all of India, though. There's only one piece. That's true. Yeah. Sure. So we have a question here. We want to keep it to history, right? Inshallah, because if we talk about what's going on in India, we're going to be here the whole night. Uh, how about Ghaznavi? Did he not attack India and destroyed many times? So he only went into Gujarat and to a few cities in UP, in northern India. So it's just, you know, he made Lahore like the local capital, and he only went a little bit into, into India. And yes, it is very true that he did destroy temples and leveled them. And it is true that in a couple of cases that they built masjids in those areas. But it's very, very isolated and it did not really happen in the rest of India. That's why I mentioned it. When we talk about the Ghaznavid Empire, I made sure that we know about it so that way we don't mix it up with the other ones. Also in Delhi, you come across a lot of Muslim monuments, the administrative taxation system, as well as preventing the Mongol invasion. So that's another positive that we didn't talk about is they were professional administrators. And this is because India at the time had never experienced a national type government. And this Sultanate established a governmental system that is across different regions. And so that was something that was very new. And it was kind of like a, a blueprint that maybe the Mughal Empire could use when the time comes. So we hope that the conditions of Muslims in India will improve, inshallah, especially in Kashmir. And uh, there's so many places in Sudan, in Palestine, where people are suffering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah alleviate all of their hardship and our hardship. May Allah forgive all of those who've passed away from among us and heal all of those who are sick. Subhana rabbika rabbil azzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.